Hi, I'm Anissa Ryland, Director here at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development, and I just want to welcome you to today's webinar. I want to make a couple of brief announcements before we get started. We host this webinar series so that listeners everywhere have access to the information and discussions we cover in these presentations. We do host different webinars every month, so please visit our website to view the schedule for upcoming presentations. You can find them by going to www.johnson-center.org, then click on the webinars link on the right-hand side. Our 2019 schedule will be posted next week, so uh, be sure and check there. And if we do often add uh, new webinars often, so if you're not on our email list, I do encourage you to visit our website and click on the join our email link that appears on the homepage. To get instant news and events and updates from the Johnson Center, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, as we do often announce grants and scholarship opportunities, new webinars and events, research opportunities, and presentations there. And be sure to check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the Johnson Center. You'll find a library there of several of our past presentations. We do have some great local programs still to come this year, including some fun holiday events. Those of you who are nearby are invited to join us for our annual holiday open house on December 11th from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m., where I do have it on good authority that Mr. and Mrs. Claus will be making a special guest appearance. I also wanted to let you know we've recently announced a program providing sliding fee scale counseling services with additional grants available in order to make appropriate counseling services available for everyone. And our diagnostic clinic now has a number of grants and supports available in order to ensure that families have faster access to assessment services. So be sure and follow our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram pages, or check out our website blog for more information. And please be sure to follow our colleagues over at the Autism Research Institute as they host their own webinar initiative and share some great resources on their website and social media pages. If you'd like a certificate of attendance after today's webinar, look for a follow-up email in your mailbox one hour after the webinar concludes, or look for the link on our YouTube channel in the webinar description. It'll contain instructions on how to get your certificate. If you have any questions during the live presentation, please type them in your GoToWebinar control panel or email info, I-N-F-O, at johnson-center.org. If you're watching a recording of this webinar on YouTube, you may email questions to the presenter at info at johnson-center.org. So let's get started. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today for this free presentation. Today we're going to talk a little bit about many of the therapies and support programs that are offered for children with autism spectrum disorder. Now in the title you saw the word complementary, and what do we mean by that? Basically we mean therapies and supports that can work together to address the various needs that may be present for a child with an autism diagnosis. Now my goal today is to simply give an overview of some of the most common therapy supports and interventions that are out there so that you're aware that they exist and have an idea of what they do or why a person may look into them. I certainly don't have time to go into or research um, everything that's out there. By no means could I cover that in an hour, but I will go through some of the more common therapies and programs that we've seen used with children over the last couple of decades. My hope is to give you an introduction with some information and resources that may help direct you to find more information. And please know that this list of therapies is not in any way exhaustive or in any particular order. I will start with a few first few that we do typically see people start with, um, but from there it really just depends on the needs and interventions and access. So not every child's gonna need every therapy or intervention we talk about, of course. In fact, most won't. But I will try to give you enough information so that you can get a better idea of what services might be worth for further investigation. Please feel free to ask questions. As I mentioned, you can do so in that GoToWebinar panel on your screen, or you can email us those questions. I do have a lot to get through today, um, certainly more than I originally thought I would. So if I don't get to questions today, I will try to either respond directly to you, or I'll include them in our next Q&A webinar that's gonna be coming up um, here in early January. So let's get to it. First, I wanna start at the beginning. You know, a child has received an autism diagnosis, but before we dive into those therapies and programs that we know exist, we do need to first stop and make sure we're asking the right questions. And to do that, we have to start with the diagnosis itself. So look at how the child received a diagnosis. Who made that diagnosis? Did they use any standardized tests or observations? Because diagnoses come in many different forms and from many different places. Maybe the child had a brief appointment with a doctor who gave a note on a prescription pad that had the words autism spectrum disorder written on it. We've seen that. Maybe a child had a school evaluation based on teacher reports and observations, or maybe you saw a psychologist who did a thorough evaluation. 
the information that comes with the diagnosis is really critical in determining what the next step should be. There is no one size fits all program or protocol that you need, and you need that data to determine what it is that your child needs. Think of an evaluation and a diagnostic report as a blueprint. Not only should the blueprint tell you what kind of house it is you're building, but also point out the specific areas that need more attention, areas that are already strong and solid, along with data and guidance for the people who are working in the house. A diagnostic report should do the same thing. It should identify the appropriate diagnosis or even diagnoses, as it really isn't uncommon that there's more than one. It should identify areas of strengths or challenges for that child and provide data and guidance on areas of intervention that should be addressed. Now, when it comes specifically to autism, the gold standard diagnostic tools are the ADOS and the ADIR. The ADOS, which stands for Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, and now we use what's called the ADOS-2, is a standardized test that is performed by a trained evaluator with clinical expertise. It's done with the child and the evaluator. And then the ADIR, or the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revised, is a standardized interview that's completed between the evaluator and the parent or caregiver. And these two tools, together are what's known as the gold standard tools for making an autism diagnosis. They will not only identify if a person does or does not have autism, but will also give information on that per person's strengths and challenges. And this information, which should be provided in that evaluator's report, is really invaluable in making informed, appropriate, uh, and individualized decisions about what support and therapies might be needed. But that isn't the entire picture. A full neuropsychological assessment will not only fully evaluate a person for an autism spectrum disorder, but it can also provide an analysis of any co of the cognitive functioning of the person who's being evaluated. And then people with autism often do have comorbid or co-occurring conditions. These could include ADHD or ADD, anxiety, um, learning disorders and disabilities, intellectual disabilities, processing disorders, and more. And people with autism also have cognitive strengths and other strengths that should be identified in that evaluation, and that will help develop and use effective support strategies. So a thorough neuropsychological exam and report will not only provide the appropriate diagnosis or diagnoses, but it'll also provide that blueprint for effective and individual st individualized strategies, and will identify those strengths that will highlight and focus on for best outcomes. This really is a critical step in the process and should not be skipped. So if you know a child or have a child who has a diagnosis but hasn't had that thorough evaluation, that's really an important place and it's not too late to go back and get that um, so you can make those decisions based on that data. Now, I do wanna take just a second here and talk about one of the most important things to remember and that is that children with autism are children. <laughs> now, I know that isn't a big revelation or anything, but I can't tell you how many times someone's come in describing a behavior or symptom um, Hang on one second. Sorry, I just realized that you guys probably can't see the slides that I'm. Here we go, let's try that. Hopefully that will take care of it. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, and you didn't miss any great slides. I'll go back and see. Those are the pretty pictures you missed. Um, anyway, we have people who will come in and talk about um, they've seen a behavior or a symptom and they're worried and they wanna know what therapy will address this or that or what clinician they need to see. And then after talking about it, sometimes it becomes clear that that might be a developmentally appropriate symptom or behavior or a symptom that all kids get. You know, kids with autism throw tantrums like other children. They go through stages of lying or telling bad jokes or refusing to eat their vegetables, just like all kids. And kids with autism get ear infections and tummy aches, rashes, head lice, just like all other kids. And really often a lot of the same old parenting tricks of clear and consistent expectations, appropriate consequences, modeling, ignoring attention seeking behavior, paying attention to the positive things, these will all have great benefit. So really the trick is to tease out um, what is developmentally appropriate and what isn't. What well, might be a response to a challenge like being able to communicate well or not understanding the expectations and sometimes teasing out the outbursts or moodiness or even self-injury, aggression, things like that, that can actually be an indication there's something physically wrong with the child and that they're unable to communicate it to us. So this again is where that neuropsychiatric evaluation can really be invaluable in helping give us more information about what might be going on. So back to the what now, we have our diagnosis, let's assume we've had that, that full evaluation, we know what's going on, we have the supporting data that tells us the areas of strengths and the challenges the child has and identifies some areas to focus on in order to improve the life of the child. 
Let's talk about some of those therapies and support options that might help address the challenges and build strength and gain, uh, gains that are needed for support. We're going to start with the most common. At the top of the presentation, I said we'd talk about programs beyond ECI or school, but let's take just a minute to talk about those as they really are often the first therapeutic refer referrals that we see when it comes to kids with developmental disorders and an autism diagnosis. Now, Early Childhood Intervention, or ECI, these are programs that provide some support for families with children birth, uh, uh, birth up to age three, for kids who have developmental delays, um, certain disabilities, or certain medical diagnoses that might impact their development. Typically, these are state-run programs that are funded, <coughs> excuse me, funded by insurance or state programs, depending on the family's ability to pay. They provide support services that can include things like um, case management, speech, occupational physical therapy, nutrition, maybe nursing support, social work, counseling services, and often relates a focus on the family and training people in the families. Um, typically, they're provided, the services are provided in the home or community, and they end when it's either determined the child no longer needs services or when a child turns three years old, whichever comes first. Now, people, people will often get referrals to ECI from a pediatrician or family care doctor or when a diagnosis is given. Uh, here in Texas, you can look up ECI providers at the website on the screen. But it really does need to be said that the reality is, particularly here in Texas, but everywhere, that budget cuts and increased demands have put a significant strain on many ECI service providers, and many families report it can be really challenging to get the needed services and support through ECI. Understanding the process and knowing your rights is really a crucial first step for navigating that system. Now, special education. Um, so if you have a child over the age of three and they receive a diagnosis of autism or developmental disorder, they're likely going to be referred for special education services. If your child's already receiving ECI services and they must exit the program by the time they turn three, then they'll get that referral um, for special education services. So when the kids are between the ages of three and five, they would get a referral for PPCD services, and that stands for Preschool Programs for Children with Disabilities. In the U.S., PPCD is a free program offered through your child's school district. It might include classroom services as well as uh, speech, occupational, and physical therapies. If your child's over the age of five, they'd be evaluated for special education services in their community-based school. The first step for any child ages three to 22 seeking any public school education services would be an ARD meeting, A-R-D. An ARD's an acronym for Admission, Review, and Dismissal. And an ARD meeting is a meeting of a group of people who help to determine whether or not a student is eligible for any special education services. And if they are, then develop what's called the IEP, or the Individualized Education Program for that eligible student. The IEP is the document or agreement that outlines the child's diagnosis, uh, their educational goals, and what services or supports the school will provide to help the child meet those goals. Parents are a critical member of the ARD team, and they should have an active role in creating and later modifying any IEP. And as the children get older and as they're able, they may participate in this process as well. Much like ECI, understanding the process and knowing your child's rights are critical to navigating the special education system in order to advocate for your child's needs. And there's lots of resources, lots of great books on this, and if you need any referrals, please just let us know. So the next thing we often see uh, children get referrals for is speech therapy. Speech therapy is one of the most frequently employed therapies in children with ASD. Often kids will be in speech therapy before they receive an autism diagnosis as an absence of speech or a speech delay is often one of the first developmental concerns that are noticed in a child who may have a developmental delay or disorder. Speech therapy is also pretty accessible. There are many speech language pathologists located around the world and it can take place in many different settings, things like home or school or in a clinic. And it is often covered by health insurance, though there may be limitations on policies and it can sometimes be challenging to get coverage for the recommended frequency of therapy sessions. And it's not uncommon to see kids who are getting speech therapy both in the ho uh, home or private as well as in school. Now speech therapy, um, works to increase communication skills. Increasing communication skills involves learning new sounds and words, uh, learning to participate in conversations, two-way conversations, and even understanding nonverbal cues. A speech language pathologist, or an SLP, evaluates the child in order to develop a plan with individualized goals. So some skills that might be worked on involve things like shaping sounds into words, or answering questions, matching words to objects, or improving enunciation, or even understanding body language. 
You may also hear parents refer to their child's speech therapy program as PROMPT therapy. And PROMPT is an acronym for Prompts for Restructuring Oral Muscular Phonetic Targets. This is a speech therapy technique and its specific approach that uses touch cues to areas around a child's mouth to manually guide them through um, targeted words, phrases, or sentences. This technique is meant to help develop motor control and improve the development of proper oral muscular movements while eliminating any unnecessary muscle movements. Speech language pathologists go through specific additional training programs to become prompt certified. Another therapy we see often uh, referred, for early, referred early on is occupational therapy. So occupational therapists will evaluate sensory, motor, cognitive, social, and communication skills that are related to participation in everyday life activities. Particular emphasis is placed on assessing their sensory motor development and emotional regulation. So when creating an OT intervention plan, occupational therapy practitioners will often evaluate kids with autism with observation, parent and teacher reports, um, parent interviews about things like the child's play preferences, uh, their eating habits, self-care and daily living skills, can they dress themselves, brush their teeth, button, tie, tie, tie shoes, things like that. In setting goals, um, OTs or occupational therapy practitioners will work with families and teachers as a team to address these issues, whether there are fine motor challenges like handwriting or buttoning, um, gross motor skills like bigger physical movements and play, coordination issues, and more. And occupational therapy is also used to help address sensory processing disorders, which are some of those comorbid or co-occurring conditions I referred to earlier. So things like sensory processing disorder or dyspraxia, um, a lot of times those challenges or, or deficits are addressed in occupational therapy. Occupational therapy can be done in the school. Um, there can be home-based sessions or in an occupational therapy center. And often occupational therapy centers look like play gyms, and that helps facilitate the development of those gross motor skills, play skills, and more. Another type of therapy that's often early on referred to is physical therapy. And again, not every child needs this, but some children with autism may have motor skill impairments, or they may have those comorbid or co-occurring conditions that present physical challenges. Physical therapy works to improve those motor skills, increase movement, develop better coordination, one of the main goals in physical therapy is to increase child's participation in daily activities. And, and like many of these things, um, the earlier physical therapy done, is done, the better. It can take place again in the home, school, or clinic setting. Another therapy you're probably familiar with, it's often early referred to, is applied behavioral analysis. So applied behavioral analysis, or ABA as it's called for short, is often a prescribed intervention for children with developmental disorders. But I will say there seems to be still many misconceptions about it. Many providers and schools will talk about a packaged ABA program or particular curriculum, but it's important to remember that there's no single program or plan that is ABA. ABA is simply the application of behavioral principles to everyday situations that will, over time, increase or decrease targeted behaviors. ABA has been used to help people acquire lots of skills, including language, uh, self-help skills, play skills, um, they can also, the principles can be used to decrease um, challenging behaviors like aggression or self-stimulatory behavior, self-injury, um, things that are, are harmful to the child. Now, ABA employs objective data to drive decision making for any child's program. That is, data is collected on things the child is doing to determine if progress is being made or not. And if you're not making progress or enough progress using a particular approach, we need to reevaluate that, change it, so that the child can begin to make progress on their goals. Now, ABA is not exclusive to autism. It can be used for almost anything. If it's an observable behavior, ABA principles exist that can be used to increase or decrease that behavior. ABA providers in autism specifically are working to increase or improve things like socially significant behaviors like communication, uh, social skills, academics, reading, adaptive living skills, gross and fine motor skills, things like toileting, dressing, uh, eating, personal self-care, um, domestic skills, chores, things around the house, work skills, so lots of things. The principles and sciences behind ABA are really employed in a number of different programs that you might have heard of, um, including things like discrete trial programs, verbal behavior programs, pivotal response training, uh, the early uh, start Denver model. ABA programs are designed and supervised um, 
by a BCBA, that stands for a Board Certified Behavior Analyst, and typically the BCBA will train and supervise therapists or people called behavioral technicians who will actually implement the programs as well as assist and train the parents or caregivers on the child's program. Now we often get asked um, about ABA and frequency and how much is enough. So the short answer is that the research supports a minimum of 25 hours per week of intensive behavioral intervention year-round for young children who have an autism diagnosis. The original studies that were done on ABA and autism did show that approximately half the children were able to achieve what was called typical development with an average of 40 hours per week over at least two years. There's no single study that can inform a parent on how much time, what that optimal number is for their child. ABA should really be incorporated into a family's everyday life. This doesn't mean you're sitting at a table doing table work or flashcards all day or you're following your child around with a clipboard and a pen all day. It just means that the family learns those ABA principles and applies them in the natural context of their daily life. They provide consistency and support for their child at all times. And really, a qualified and skilled BCBA will make parent training a critical part of any ABA program, and that'll ensure that families have the tools they need to best support their child. ABA programs now may co be covered by health insurance. Most states have some sort of insurance mandate for ABA coverage, but there are exceptions, limitations, and exclusions. So there's a summary right now of the state laws that are regarding insurance coverage for ABA that you can find at this website on the National Conference of State Legislators site that's at the bottom of the screen. And I'll leave that up for a second. I'll also post that at the end. Now other therapy programs um, do what's called a relationship-based approach. Developmental relationship-based approaches are programs that are used to teach children with autism based on theories of human development and developmental pragmatics. Some of these programs that you might have heard of include the floor time approach and the relationship development model or what's called RDI. Advocates of these approaches believe that relationships are the means that we can um, you teach the growing child to communicate, regulate their emotion, uh, establish a foundation for more complex thinking, and increase some of those complex social interactions. So let's take floor time, for example. The basic premise of floor time, and this is oversimplified, but the basic premise is that an adult can help a child th uh, um, increase their circles of communication by meeting the child at their developmental level and then building on their strengths. The therapy is often incorporated into play activities and it's often done sitting on the floor. Uh, floor time does not distinctly or separately focus on things like speech or cognitive or motor skills, but instead tries to address these areas by focusing on the child's emotional development. RDI has some similar principles, but one main difference is that while floor time is mainly child-directed, meaning that the child's preferences are driving the cho chosen activities, RDI is adult-directed, meaning that the parent or person, person working with the child is choosing the tasks. There are some other differences in these models as well, and there are lots of resources, books, and things online that you can find more information. Typically, these programs are self-funded, meaning they're paid for by the families. I've heard of a very few instances where the therapy was provided in the context of something else, another service, like a speech therapist providing floor time, and there might be some coverage for that. Um, so you should be able to talk to providers about what cost and coverage might be available. Now, children with autism we mentioned before often have other diagnoses, including ADHD, anxiety, depression. We actually have a webinar on our um, YouTube channel library specifically about depression um, and autism. We have another one up there about anxiety, and we have another one coming up early in the year about anxiety. Um, these are issues that are common and come up often in our community. So even if they don't, and even if kids don't have the diagnosis, Parents often report seeing those symptoms of anxiety or depression. So psychotherapy or counseling services by a qualified therapist with training and experience with people with autism can be an, an effective therapeutic tool. Uh, similarly, counseling services can also be really effective in providing sibling and family support, which, you know, in that cycle helps the child as well. Um, finding a counselor who has knowledge and experience working with people with autism really is crucial. You can find more information about this um, on one of our recent webinars, again, on our YouTube channel um, about counseling considerations for people with ASD. There's also one about siblings and caregivers. Um, but it's important to watch that and understand what you need to be looking for in a counselor or therapist for a child with autism to make sure that it's effective. 
Another therapy that you may have heard of that um, is often used in kids with autism is music therapy. Music therapy is the clinical use of music interventions to accomplish some individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has uh, completed an approved music therapy program. According to the American Music Therapy Association, most people with autism do respond positively to music and show a heightened interest in response to music, making it a good therapeutic tool. Um, music therapy has been used to support emotional, cognitive, and social development in many populations, not just autism, um, and may help to promote wellness by managing stress, uh, enhancing memory, and improving communication and social interactions. Most kids find music fun, so it can be recreational as well as therapeutic. Another therapy uh, you may have heard of is art therapy. And now art therapy is conducted um, with the aim of building life skills, addressing deficits and problem behaviors, and promoting um, healthy self-expression. Art therapists typically will encourage their clients to explore and express themselves using art material. Art therapists try to utilize art as an alternative form of communication. Uh, they use it to help build social skills and work on sensory issues while exploring different mediums. And again, this is used across lots of populations, not just in developmental disorders. And there was a study that was published last year in the journal Arts and Psychotherapy that developed a set of guidelines for delivering art therapy specifically for children who have autism. And the proposed guidelines kind of serve as a basis of successful practice for art therapy. Some of those best practices were things like using the same routine to begin each session, explaining instructions in a consistent manner, um, trying to spark curiosity, teaching new skills, and being aware of and planning for transitions into new activities. So the goal of the paper and the researchers in the paper was to really help build evidence that this can be a useful therapeutic tool for some kids with autism. Recreational therapy. Um, and there's a little bit of overlap on some of these. Some people would maybe define some music or art or other therapies we'll talk about later as recreation. Sometimes they are um, more therapeutic and individualized with specific goals. But therapeutic recreation specialists, or what we would call rec therapists or recreational therapists, work to provide treatment services and recreation activities for people with autism and other um, disorders, again, in other populations. They help integrate people with autism into their communities by helping them access and use community resources and helping them uh, participate in recreational activities, including things like sports or the arts, um, animals, games, more. Um, there's a big social component to recreational therapy and figuring out what your child might enjoy is really an important part of this approach. This can be helping them to cultivate and participate in a hobby, participating in sporting events, um, so there's lots of options, but really it's the idea of getting them into the community and finding things they enjoy and can share enjoying with other people. Hippotherapy is the use of horseback riding as a therapeutic or rehabilitative treatment, especially as a means of improving things like coordination, balance, strength. Other benefits that have been reported include improvements in posture and flexibility, along with improvements in concentration. Now, hippotherapy is provided by, uh, typically provided by speech, occupational, or physical therapy um, uh, professionals who have received additional training. So they will often incorporate therapeutic goals from speech, OT, or PT into the hippotherapy program as well. I think and it's important to note here that there is a difference between hippotherapy and therapeutic riding programs. Therapeutic riding teaches the rider to control the horse using skills um, like reining and the use of aids. All therapeutic writing sessions should be conducted by a PATH certified instructor and periodically reassessed um, by a licensed therapist. Now, therapeutic writing sessions are typically conducted in small groups, maybe two or three writers at a time, with all of them being accompanied by a leader and two sidewalkers if needed. And really the best way to think about the distinction between the two is that hippotherapy is like a one-on-one -on -one session or treatment with a speech therapist, occupational therapist, or physical therapist, and has specific therapeutic goals, while therapeutic riding is more like an adapted horseback riding lesson. So it's really focused on learning to ride the horse. Exercise, um, and again, you can see there's definitely some crossover here between some of these programs and things we're talking about, but I wanna talk specifically just about exercise for a moment, um, because like I said, there is crossover between those OT, PT, rec therapy, um, goals and the like, but exercise therapy programs are really emerging right now as a meaningful support for many people with autism. And it isn't just about fitness. 
Research is showing that exercise really can help improve focus, decrease some of those maladaptive behaviors like self-injury and aggression, and improve social skills and language development. There's some great exercise programs and apps for kids that are available now, and many can be done on their own or incorporated into a child's existing uh, therapeutic program, whether that's an ABA program or um, a relationship development program, or you can incorporate some exercise goals and reap those benefits. Massage therapy um, is another therapy that uh, we often hear people accessing. It's, again, one that sometimes is covered by some of the state uh, Medicaid waiver programs or offered by those programs. And in some published studies, pediatric massage has been reported to be effective intervention in aiding things like uh, relaxation, helping the child adapt to more tactile stimulation or touch. Over time, children might become more spatially aware, have better body awareness in general. And there have been reports that it also can help improve sleep. And now I want to switch gears just a little bit in terms of therapies and talk a little bit about the medical evaluations and care for children with an autism diagnosis. As I said in the beginning, it really is important to realize that all our kids are kids. They're all going to get their share of bumps, um, bugs, viruses, colds, all those things that all kids get. But it also is important to know that children with autism are at a higher risk for several medical concerns. And it's important to find pediatricians and specialists who are knowledgeable and informed about the special health care needs of the autism population. There's been a lot of emerging research in this area in the last five to 10 years. And so you really want someone who is keeping up on that because through some great um, hospitals and programs, there's been a lot of great research that's really updated our understanding about the specific health care needs of people with autism. So let's start with talking about a genetic evaluation. So the American College of Medical Geneticists recommends that all people who have an autism uh, spectrum disorder diagnosis be evaluated by a geneticist, a doctor who specializes in diagnosing and, if needed, managing hereditary disorders. Now, really the main reason to consider a genetics evaluation is that the evaluation will screen for known medical problems that are related to an autism diagnosis. Uh, sometimes autism occurs when a child has a particular genetic syndrome. Some examples um, would be things like Rett syndrome or Fragile X or tuberous sclerosis. So children who have these syndromes are at risk for other medical issues, so it really is important to know about them. A secondary reason for a genetic evaluation would be to look at the risk for other family members or future family members, as there is a known genetic component. Let's talk a little bit about neurological evaluations or um, seizures. So seizures are a really big concern and are fairly common in people with autism. In fact, seizures are the most prevalent neurological disorder associated with autism. While about 2% of children in the general population develop epilepsy, the prevalence in autism is much higher, although we don't know exactly what it is. Estimates vary widely from about 5% to 38%. Some people with autism will develop seizures in childhood, while others don't develop them until puberty or even into adulthood. And certain subgroups, subgroups of people with autism have a higher risk for developing seizure disorders and epilepsy, including some of those comorbid or co-occurring um, things like cognitive disabilities and certain genetic disorders. So again, that makes that neuropsychological evaluation and that genetic testing we talked about earlier in the presentation all the more important because knowing if there's a cognitive disability or a specific genetic disorder can alert you to the potential risk for seizure disorders. Um, let's talk about gastroenterology and GI symptoms. Patients, parents, and caregivers often report gastrointestinal symptoms in children with autism. In fact, recent research has shown that GI disorders are four times more common in children with autism than in the general population. Issues like gastritis, um, chronic constipation or diarrhea, colitis, esophagitis are all often reported as problems. And unfortunately, it's not always so clear cut that that's the issue. Pain caused by these GI issues are sometimes missed because the child may not be able to communicate their symptoms um, at all or in a, what we would expect to be a typical way. Sometimes symptoms like aggression, self-injury, an increase in self-stimulatory or self-soothing behaviors might be tied to GI symptoms, particularly if the child is nonverbal or doesn't have the ability to recognize and communicate their physical symptoms. And treating GI problems may result in behavioral improvements, sleep improvements, things like that. 
So a knowledgeable uh, pediatrician, a knowledgeable gastroenterologist with experience with children with autism might be able to help you with these concerns. Sleep problems are quite common in children and adolescents with autism. Obviously, sleep disruptions have a big impact on learning, attention, and health, not only for the child, but also for the parents as well. Sleep issues can be caused by medical problems or environmental or behavioral issues or a combination of all of the above. A physician can help you evaluate for those medical issues um, and rule out any potential issues and recommend potential treatments. And a behavioral provider or a counselor can help you address behavioral issues and develop a sleep hygiene program that can help set your child and thus you up for successful sleep habits. We are gonna have a webinar coming up early next year specifically about sleep and sleep hygiene. Uh, nutrition, so, uh, or picky eating, um, is something that a lot of people are very familiar with. Um, picky eating, or what we also call food selectivity, impacts up to 70% of children with autism, and this can present health risks for the child. It can restrict activities within the family and can certainly increase parent and family stress. Uh, some children also have sensory or oral motor issues that can impact their ability to chew or swallow certain foods. So feeding therapy programs can help when they're implemented by a qualified professional. It is important to rule, first rule out any medical issues or food allergies that could be contributing to or causing any eating challenges before beginning a feeding program. You wanna know what's going on. And it's also really important to consider those sensory issues and to consider the child's food preferences in the development of any um, supportive program for feeding. We all have things we like, we all have things we don't like, and that's okay. We just need to make sure that we're trying new things and expanding the palate so that we're getting enough nutritious food. And then on nutrition, um, for most kids with autism, diet and nutrition do play a foundational and fundamental role in their health care. Those selective eating concerns we just talked about, coupled with those gastrointestinal concerns we talked about, increase the probability that kids with autism need evaluation for dietary intake and nutritional status. This would include a three-day nutrient intake analysis and a consultation with a qualified professional to talk about um, those results, followed by any recommendations for any diet changes or nutritional supplementation that might be necessary to address any of those gaps or deficiencies. That evaluation could also include functional nutrition support based on the body of research out there looking at therapeutic nutrition for those people with autism that can help address things like language, behavior, coordination of muscle function, and sleep. And then there's more. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, adjunct therapies and other supports. You know, there's auditory integration training, um, chiropractic care medication and medication management, animal-assisted therapies um, and service dogs, neurofeedback programs, aromatherapy programs, therapeutic programs like CERTs or RPM, there's vision therapy, auditory processing disorders, um, using PEC systems, using technology-based therapies, on and on and on and on. As I said earlier, you know, I'm, I, I can't even come close to talking about all the things we've heard of. I've tried to cover the most common and give you some of the logic, and it can really be overwhelming. There's a lot out there, particularly if you're a new parent and you've just gotten a diagnosis and you start talking to people and all these things and more that I've just mentioned to you, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, it can be overwhelming. So I wanna just say, let's take a deep breath because we got this. I gave you the answer to that at the top of the hour. And really, that is having objective information. We've covered an example of the, all those evaluations and therapies for children with autism. I know now, you know, some of us might be sitting on the floor crying, eating raw, raw cookie dough and saying, what now, what do I do? But really, let's go back to that beginning. The best tool in your toolkit is that thorough diagnostic evaluation. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it really isn't said enough. And even when people have those evaluations, they're not really using them for the tools that they can be. I know it can be overwhelming. You can feel like Callan's dad in the peanut butter aisle. I really do. I've been there. But you can use that objective data from an independent evaluation to help make decisions that really make a difference for your child and your family. And the key is you have to keep doing it. And what I mean by that is you have to continue to use the blueprint. And this is something that isn't said often enough. Kids grow. 
and they learn and they change and that's wonderful and it's a fundamental truth with all children but as they grow and learn and change so do their needs particularly when we're targeting and teaching specific skills one would hope that with the amount of time and resources and energy and dedication that we all give to these programs and how hard our kids work that we provide that there's going to be benefit that comes from those programs so the only way to get the instructions on how best to continue to move forward is to continue to gather that objective data. Revise that blueprint. If we're building a house and we suddenly learn our family is growing and expanding, we're probably going to need to revise our blueprint, make some changes. And as our kids grow and learn, we need to do the same thing. So repeating neuropsych testing is a crucial and beneficial step and something that isn't done or recommended enough. Most people think I've had the diagnostic evaluation, I've gotten the information, I have the diagnosis, I'm done. I don't need to revisit that. But you don't get one blood test in your life and think you never need another one. You don't go to school and take one test and then never have to demonstrate you've learned things ever again. In order to appropriately determine a child's needs at that time and then effectively monitor the therapies and interventions that they're going to be participating in, you're going to need ongoing and relevant information to keep making the best decisions. So what do I mean by monitoring? When a child and their family are participating in a therapeutic program, it's a big investment. It's an investment of time. It's an investment of hope. It's an investment of money, either their own or their insurance company. And usually that's a combination of both. So in order to ensure that any program or therapy is effective and worth that investment, you need information. And sometimes that's easy to come by. Your child isn't sleeping and you start a new medication or you change their diet or you start a sleep hygiene program and they start sleeping. You have the evidence in front of you to say, I know it works. At least you do as long as you've only implemented one change at a time. But often it's more complicated. Things like counseling, ABA, floor time, speech, OT, many of these other programs we've talked about, they're big picture, long-term, complex programs. And truly monitoring their effectiveness over long periods of time can be challenging for many reasons. First, children almost always change over time, no matter what. They learn as, they, as time goes by, some faster and more noticeably than others, but they do. Second, these programs that are often working in many different areas. And then third, our children's needs change, and good providers are constantly striving to adapt to those needs. So um, let's say, for example, that your child is working on labeling and some play skills in their program, but then they develop some self-aggression behaviors, and the therapists need to change focus to deal with that more immediate need. So now what are we working on? What are we doing and measuring? When do we go back to those original goals? What are we monitoring? What are we teaching? And how do we know it's effective? Too often parents will rely on the programs and service providers themselves to monitor their own success. And while almost all of the professionals I know who work in this community are dedicated, compassionate, smart people who are truly trying to help the children they serve, some sort of objective independent evaluation is almost always needed and beneficial to keep programs fresh, uh, focused, and effective. We're all human and it's way too easy to go down one path missing cues or skip, skipping steps that could be beneficial. Having those fresh eyes, new information, and a different perspective can bring new ideas, can bring fresh energy, and bring a wider perspective to many of our therapy programs. So let me put it this way. Let's say that you have a child who's in an ABA program 15 hours a week with parent training. That program is going to likely cost someone, whether it's the family, their insurance company, or both, anywhere from, let's say, twenty-five dollars to $35,000 a year. It's a lot of money. So the BCBA has data that shows that the programs are working, um, that they're effective, and that progress has made, been made. So we're good, right? Well, here's the thing. While it's likely true that the programs that they're working on have had some positive data, that there's been progress, what if there's other programs that they should be working on? What if the programs need to be expanded? What if they need to be refocused? What if progress could be faster? Or what if the progress has pushed the child's skills in that area beyond what is developmentally appropriate for their age, meaning they're ahead of their peers in some areas while they're behind in others. A fresh perspective here can help and can be a really wise investment. So you can invest a little to make sure that the lot you're investing is more effective. A good way to gain that, along with more direction for moving forward, again, is in that repeated neuropsychological evaluation. It's a common misconception that the tests and the data gathered in these evaluations need only be done once. 
you don't get on the scale and weigh yourself once and never get on again, assuming your weight never changes. If only that were true, <laughs> but it's not. Things change and your child's strengths and the areas of challenge that they have will change. It's even possible for a child's diagnoses to change or for new diagnoses to emerge. And that's really important information. And these changes can not only help you determine what other supports and therapies might help, but can also help you monitor the effectiveness of the therapies that they've been doing. If you're targeting specific areas and seeing little or no change over time, it might be time to do something differently. So talk to your psychologist about the frequency of testing. Factors like the child's age, the tests that are being used, and the interventions that are being employed, and, and the intensity that they're being employed can all be factors in determining how often those tests should be repeated and then compared. And here's the most important thing, and it's going to be really cliche, but you need to take it one step at a time. You really must, because each of these steps is going to reveal the next step. And as we said before, kids need change. Sometimes meeting one need with one support or therapy will take care of something else or reveal the need for something else. So have a trusted clinician or an advisor who can help you continually evaluate, discuss, and research the next steps. And take time to learn the appropriate, um, or to learn and, and, and to appreciate what's happening. Celebrate the successes. Don't miss the milestones, the new skills, the new questions, and the gifts that the kids in your life are going to bring to you every day. It's really important to notice those things, to celebrate them, and then evaluate where you go from there. So um, I do want to thank you. I'm going to put this up here. I'm going to take a look at some of the questions you guys have. I know we went through that really fast, and I know it was a lot of information. Uh, this presentation will be put on our YouTube channel um, soon so that you can refer back to it. And again, if you have questions or ideas, if you think for future presentations there are other therapies we should include and talk about, um, don't hesitate to email us. You have the email there on the screen or contact us because we're always interested um, in hearing what you have to say. And we have, again, we're making our webinar schedule for the next year and posting it. So some of your questions might stimulate more presentations on some of those subjects. So let me take a look here. Um, oops, sorry about that. This is a good point. Someone says it's very good to find a good autism support group in your area. It's exhausting for the caregiver. Um, and some things you'll try won't be beneficial to your child because something that works with one child won't work for another. And that's a really good point. Um, there's definitely, you're going to hear from other parents. Um, it's good to get support, but you'll also hear them say, this is a thing that was the greatest thing in the whole world. And maybe it is but it also um, might not work for your child. So again, that's where I would say refer back to that neuropsych evaluation because if their child didn't have the same attention issues or maybe didn't have the same language processing issues or didn't have the same challenges or strengths, then that might be a clue that that might not be the therapy intervention that would work specifically for your child, that it worked for them. Um, that's not saying it won't, but again, that that's your blueprint. That's when you're going to say, well, well, we really need to be focusing right now. Our biggest challenges are here. So maybe that's something that um, we need to focus elsewhere on and maybe come back to that. And again, most of the people I know um, who have children, I have a child who's 20 who's have autism in the course of 20 years, even in 20 years, we haven't tried everything I talked about. We've tried a lot of it over the course of 20 years. Um, and he's tried a lot of that. But again, it, same thing as the everyone, everything won't be right for everyone. You may be that one or two of those things are all you need to provide the support that your child needs to be happy and successful. And that's great. But as you go through those evaluations, as you get clues to what their challenges and strengths might be, that evaluation uh, can help point you in direction of some of the therapies we've talked about or even other ones. Uh, let's see, another question. Sorry about that. We're gonna go over here. Um, where do you suggest we go in order to get the thorough diagnostic evaluation? Well, that's a very good question. Um, typically, those are done by psychologists who have experience in the tests that we talked about. So ADOS, ADIR, cognitive testing, um, which in olden days was called IQ testing, um, and things like testing for processing disorders, attention disorders, things like that. Um, there are diagnostic clinics and psychologists who specialize in those things. It's great to find one who uh, works 
with people on the spectrum and has knowledge about the therapies in your area. So I will say, for example, 20 years ago in some parts of this, the country, there weren't a lot of intervention programs. And so we would go to see neuropsychologists in areas that had them because those psychologists knew about what to recommend. Whereas ones in areas that didn't have those services may not know. That's changed quite a bit today, but you do wanna ask any potential diagnostician what their experience is in autism and if they're aware of and familiar with the services and supports in your area so that when they're making their recommendations, they can factor that into those recommendations. We have a diagnostic clinic here at the Johnson Center. We have a psychologist who does those full battery of tests and does those neuropsych neuropsychological reports. Um, there are other providers in town. And if you wanna contact us and, and let us know where you live, we can probably make referrals and recommendations in your area. Typically that evaluation would be, um, depending on your child's age and developmental level, it could be a one to two day process. Maybe uh, you bring the child in for a few hours to meet with the um, psychologist and then you come back yourself as the caregiver and do the interview. Then they're gonna analyze all that data, prepare a report, sit down with you and go through it. Typically those reports are several pages because they're going through all of the tests they've done, interpreting that data, providing that information to you. Um, and then making recommendations based on it. And then as you repeat it, it's a, it's a good idea, particularly if it's an independent evaluator, to go back to the same provider if it's a year from now, two years from now, because then you're really comparing apples and apples. Um, let's see. Can I share some specific apps for exercise? Um, I know that the Exercise Connection has a terrific app. Um, there's a young man in Chicago, Dave Geslack, who created an app um, called, I think it's called the Exercise Buddy. Um, the company is called the Exercise Connection. That's one I'm familiar with um, that I know is great. You might talk to rec therapists in your area because they might have knowledge of either programs in your area or applications that they're familiar with and use that provide services. Sorry, I think I'm... So that, that's one I know. Um, I know there are others, but I'm not familiar with them. But that might be, again, somebody mentioned going to, um, sorry, I think our sound was cutting out there. Someone mentioned going to a parent support group. That might be um, one place where you can also ask what people are using and, and where they're getting their um what apps they're using. But rec therapists, occupational therapists would probably be people who would have some good information about that. Um, somebody asked about art and music therapy sound good, but what kind and where do I go? Um, again, it depends on your area. There are national certification um, programs for things like music therapists that you can go to and look up lists. Um, parent resource groups, again, would be a good idea to ask people if you want to contact us we can make referrals because we know of places across the country that can provide that um, I know oftentimes there are um, particularly if you're on say a state Medicaid waiver program like in Texas class there are therapists that work specifically with those programs that you can access services through and get support so it really depends but I'd say parent support groups are probably the best um, resource for you in your particular area. Um, someone says lots of information here. Um, I do know that we did throw out a lot out there and it might be overwhelming, which is one of the reasons this will be on the YouTube channel you can go through. This wasn't meant to be a primer for you to make decisions. This was really meant to be an introduction so that you knew the language and you know um, kind of when you hear, when someone says music therapy, you have an idea of what that is, or somebody says a relationship development therapy, you have an idea what that is. Obviously we can go, we could do an hour on each of those slides I presented, and we might in the coming months. I would refer back to our YouTube channel because there are resources there on several of the things we talked about. Um, and there's lots of information out there on different things like um, ABA, music therapy, all of those things. If you want information about a specific area, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know. Um, we'd be more than happy to try and connect you. Um, 
to programs in your specific area if you'd like. So just reach out and say, this is where I'm at and I'm looking for this, or, or I just want more information about this. I'm happy to send resources that we're aware of if you just want to educate yourself on particular therapy programs. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Let me see here. I'm getting therapy through my school. Okay. Um, yes. So I mentioned earlier that it isn't unusual for kids to get things like speech therapy or occupational therapy through their special education services at school. Um, and sometimes even other therapies. Adaptive play therapy or adaptive PE um, is one that sometimes that we'll hear uh, that you'll see children getting. And so I think um, it isn't uncommon. It, it is typically people will also augment those therapies with private therapy, um, either private pay or insurance based, because typically school based services are, are pretty brief and they're very focused on specific goals at school. And so um, you know, school, and again, this is something we could go into, but your school go goals are really oriented around educational goals specific to school. And so a broader therapeutic program ad addressing more in-depth needs typically takes place outside of school. A lot of times school speech therapies are done in small groups. You know, you'll hear, oh, he gets 20 minutes a week in a small group. And, and most people feel like that's just not enough. Uh, let's see. Where can we get genetic testing done? Um, that would be with a geneticist. So what I would say is talk to your pediatrician and say you'd like a referral. If you already have a child who has an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, tell your pediatrician or your neurologist or whoever made the diagnosis that you would like a referral for genetic testing and they can refer to one in your area. You can also call your insurance company if you don't need a referral and ask for a geneticist who's in network. And again, then just make sure that it's they have experience and knowledge about pediatrics and autism spectrum disorder, but I believe most of them do. Um, but any geneticist then would be able to order the tests and interpret them to give you that information. I know there's more questions and I'm really sorry that I can't get them to them all today. I will try to address um, any questions directly um, and email or contact you. And again, we will include some of those in our Q&A coming up in early January. I want to thank you all for your time today. I know we've flown through a lot. We will get this posted up on the YouTube channel soon so that if you want to revisit it um, and go over certain parts, you'll be able to. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, there again is our email and phone number. Number, follow us on social media, look for our future webinars where we'll go into in-depth um, more several of the things I talked about, including sleep, including anxiety and depression, diagnostic information. So you'll be able to get a lot more information in the upcoming webinars. And I want to thank you all again. I've really enjoyed talking with you today, and I hope that you have a great day.